all had someone break trust with us, and we've probably also proven slightly untrustworthy, maybe on a rare occasion, even though half the time we don't really realize that we are not being loyal and trustworthy. And so I wanted to, I sat with the Lord, and I was like, well, what does trustworthiness look like? And so most of this is directed toward us, because we're here to learn how we can become trustworthy. But if you're especially in a marriage relationship, this might be something to sit down and talk about your husband, talk about with your husband and say, like, you know, can we both agree that this is what it looks like to be a trustworthy person in this relationship? Wouldn't that be cool to have that discussion? Just a suggestion. Okay, so these are the 10 signs that you can be trusted in your relationships. And people in close relationship with you should, again, also know these signs. So the first one is this. My actions and words show that I love you, I'm for you, and I want the best for you. Okay, so let me just repeat that. My actions and words show that I love you, I'm for you, and I want the best for you for you. Would your husband or a person in close relationship with you say that about you? That they can tell that about you? That you're always for them? That you want the best for them? It reminded me, of course, of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Whew. Yeah, we could just live up to that, right? And that's what God's calling us to press into. A second sign that you're trustworthy, I keep no secrets, but instead I'm open and transparent with you. Mm. In a marriage, this would include bank account information being open to both spouses, credit cards, email accounts, Facebook, Instagram accounts, texts on your phone, everything should be open and available. How are you doing on this one? Ephesians 4.25 says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Are you truthful and open and honest with all of those little things like email accounts, can, can your husband, is your husband free to pick up your phone and look at your text messages? Are you free to pick up his phone and look at his text messages? In, in my marriage with Raul, that was, that was always open. Like, you can check at any time, because I should have nothing that I need to hide, unless I'm buying a birthday present or something. <laughs> but I wasn't buying that every week, so really I should have my phone open most of the time. Third sign that you're trustworthy, my actions show you that I'm faithful and loyal. And this is especially critical in marriage, right? Do your actions show that you are faithful and loyal? Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Fourth, I display honesty and courage in addressing issues that could cause me to resent you so that my heart stays open to you. This is an interesting point, isn't it? Because I was sitting with the Lord and you know, I thought, oh, trustworthiness is just about like being faithful. But he's like, no, it's way bigger than that. It's even something like this, that I display honesty and courage in addressing issues that could cause me to resent you so that my heart can stay open to you. Can your spouse or a person in close relationship with you count on the fact that you're going to be honest instead of becoming more and more quietly resentful? Can they trust you to be honest, to work through those issues that are causing you to resent them? Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Fifth, I don't gossip about us or you, and I don't tell unflattering stories about you to others, even if they're funny. You know, I have to say, I was not really good at this one, because sometimes the story is just so doggone funny that I just felt compelled, you know, sitting with a group of friends to, to just tell on Raul, and, you know, something that was so funny, but if it was unflattering, was that really the right thing to do? I, I, I stumbled on this one a couple of times, because sometimes the stories were so funny, but shouldn't we be protecting the heart of that person? Can they trust that you're not going to tell unflattering stories about them? Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Sixth sign that you're trustworthy, I don't use intimate things I know about you against you to punish you. Mm. Mm. Leviticus 19, 18, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. 
sometimes we can take that stuff that we know about that person and we can wield it to hurt them when we're mad. Have you ever done that? Seven, I'm not harsh, critical, or disrespectful toward you because that would betray your heart. Right? It would betray your heart. Would your husband or other close person say this is true of you, that you're not harsh and critical and disrespectful? Can they trust that you're going to protect their heart in that way? Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Eighth sign that you can be trusted in the relationship, out of, a, out of a heart of love, I gently tell you if I'm concerned about your behavior or if you're heading the wrong direction. And the key word here is gently, right? I gently tell you if I feel like you're headed the wrong direction or maybe even sitting against me. I gently, is that my phone? No, it's mine. Oh, <laughs> I got a new phone, so I'm like, could that be my phone? I don't know how to control it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can your husband or other person in close relationship with you trust you to be gentle with their heart, even if you're offering a word of correction? Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Ninth sign that you're trustworthy, I quickly apologize if I've wounded you or sinned against you and work hard to change that behavior. Can you be trusted to quickly apologize? James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then the last trustworthy sign, I don't use you to satisfy only my needs and desires, but work to give back in the relationship and be attentive to your needs. Wow, would people in your life say that they see that kind of trustworthiness in you that you're not just making it all about you, but that you're actually attentive to their needs. Philippians 2 do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What an interesting list to go through. And I always thought, well, I'm a completely trustworthy person when it comes to a couple of those obvious points. <laughs> but, but looking at that whole list that I felt like God gave to me to share, it's like, you know, I don't think I've been completely trustworthy in every way, and I want to be more like that. How about you? And maybe this is a good list to sit down with a person in your life you're close to, a husband, and say, can we both agree that we're going to work on these points together? Because, wow, what a fantastic relationship you would have if you both worked on all those points, right? I mean, that would be a rockin' marriage right there. So how to become a trustworthy person? Sat with God on this one, too, like, well, how do we do this? Well, first of all, you'll be able to love others well and be loyal and honest and gentle when your relationship with God is strong and you actually trust him right? If you're insecure in your relationship with God, if you haven't developed a strong trust in God, then fear and insecurity will negatively affect your relationships. I felt like God said you'll be a taker in the relationship and not a giver. If you're insecure in your relationship with God, you're going to be a taker in all your human relationships instead of a giver. You'll be enticed to do whatever will seem to make you happy or make you feel better about yourself, even if that hurts people around you. We have to become anchored in that relationship with God. That's how we become secure. So how do we develop this stronger relationship with God and a deeper trust in God? Well, read the Bible. Focus on the many accounts of God doing amazing things for his people because of his compassion and love for them. I like Psalm 78, starting in verse 1. It's kind of a little long section here, but listen to what he says. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things. Things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded to our ancestors to, to teach their children, so that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children, mm -hmm. then... They would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Kind of a long section, but what it's saying to me is that keep on remembering all of God's mighty deeds and tell them to the next generation and the next generation, because when you remember his mighty deeds, you start trusting in the Lord. Some of my favorite Bible accounts that just help build my trust Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you've never read that story, it's in Daniel 3, you know, thrown into the fiery furnace. 
Now, I haven't been thrown into a fiery furnace yet, but sometimes it feels like getting pretty close to that, and yet God saved them. They, they didn't even smell like smoke. Um, Jesus multiplying the loaves and fishes in Matthew, not fish, not fishes, I guess that's the wrong pronunciation. Multiplying the loaves and fish in Matthew 14, I mean, I, that just... That just shows me that God is trustworthy as my provider. I love to reread that story. Uh, God raising Joseph from prison for years into a place of powerful leadership in Egypt. That gives me hope that I can trust God even when the circumstances don't seem to make sense, that he's got a plan and I just need to wait for it. That whole story is told in Genesis like 30 through 50. Uh, so read some of those stories and it'll start to build your faith. Also keep a God sighting journal. So that you remember the times God showed up and did amazing things in your own life. This is my God sighting journal. It's almost complete. I have one page left. I've been working on it for years because I don't write it every day. I'm not that good. Um, but I, I, I love rereading these accounts because they build my faith. They remind me that God is trustworthy. And when I know that God is trustworthy, I can start to relax a little bit. I'm going to read you uh, something. I just kind of flipped it open when I got up here this morning. This is from March 6, 2013. Raul had a heart attack last week. Uh, some of you guys probably didn't know that. Back in 2013, Raul had a heart attack. He was preaching about taking authority against the enemy of Band of Brothers when he had this heart attack. Imagine that, right? He was taken to the hospital. Blood tests taken at midnight and then at 3 a.m. showed progressively higher enzymes in the blood, which are released when someone has a heart attack. It confirms that you had a heart attack, and he had a lot of those enzymes in his blood. Tons of people started praying for him. The next morning, he went in for an angiogram to determine the location of the blocked arteries and how severe the heart attack was. But after a night of prayer, they discovered no blocked arteries whatsoever. The doctor said he has amazingly good blood flow. And that was like, wow, God can heal. When it's his choice, when it's his will, when it's in line with his will, he can do amazing acts of healing. The doctor the next day came in and told me like, you know, I love when doctors say, I don't quite understand it. When they start like that, you're like, I do, right? And so this builds my faith when I go back and reread those entries in my, in my prayer journal. Maybe it's time to keep a little God sighting journal or prayer journal. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Also develop a daily habit of, a habit of daily listening prayer. A daily habit of listening prayer. And ask God what he's up to when you don't understand your circumstances. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Honestly, I've been doing a lot of that lately, asking God to help me make sense of my circumstances and Raoul's death. And he's showing me that he's still for me, that he has everything under control. He's like shown up in all sorts of ways to just, they're like little mini God sightings all over the place. They, like he's like, look, I got that under control. Look, I blessed you with that. I blessed you over here, and I blessed you over there. Don't worry about a thing. So even when, and you, some of you I, I know right now are in a circumstance you feel is challenging, and you don't really understand what is going on, and that can make you doubt your trust in God, ask him in listening prayer, give me a glimpse as to what you're up to. Show me the little pockets of blessing. Show me that you're still in control. And I believe he will do that for you. Jeremiah 33, 3, he says, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Do you take the time to ask God what he's up to? Or do you just throw up your laundry list of prayers, uh, you know, prayer requests, and then move on with your day? Maybe it's time to pause and ask, what is he up to? Also, make it a morning habit to list the many things you're grateful for. This helps you realize that God is good, and you have blessings that you don't even deserve. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When I do this simple exercise, it's like the simplest thing, to just pause in the morning, like, Lord, remind me of the blessings I have. When I do that, I, I just trust him at a deeper level because I start to go, oh, yeah, there's that, and he blessed me with this, and he blessed me with that, and he blessed me with that, and he blessed me with that. Oh. I guess I can trust you. And it just changes my whole perspective. And it takes, what, 30 seconds to just sit with the Lord and each morning and say, okay, what are the blessings that, that I have in front of me? I still walk. You know, you healed me from COVID. Thank you for that. You know I mean? It's like just recounting those blessings changes your whole perspective and you begin to trust God again. Okay, secondly, be alert to the temptations of the enemy where he will try to entice you into behaving badly and breaking trust. Because trust me, he is 
actively trying to cause you to be an untrustworthy person, a person of low integrity. He wants you to betray other people. He wants you even to betray God. He is all about that. 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. What unhealthy people or false comforts is the devil trying to entice you with? What is that in your life where he's trying to pull you off course so that you become an untrustworthy person? So this leads to our third point. Immediately flee any situation or people that you sense could tempt you into behavior that would hurt others and break trust with them. Immediately flee. You know, many Bible heroes face all sorts of temptations with, that would have caused them to hurt others and be untrustworthy. Some caved into that temptation and some fled. I think of the person that just comes to the top of my mind that did actually give into the temptation was Peter. I mean, talk about betrayal. He's like, oh, I'll never desert you, Jesus. And then the moment the pressure's on, he's like, I don't even know who that guy is. I mean, like, totally ultimate betrayal, right? But some Bible heroes were alert to the enemy's snares, and they did whatever it took to remain a person of integrity. Joseph, back in the story in Genesis there, Joseph and the king's wife, oh my goodness sakes. So Joseph has worked his way up in the kingdom. He's, he's been released from prison. He's like, you know, top commander in, for the king. And the king's wife sets her sights on Joseph because apparently he was pretty much of a stud. And so she sets her sights on him and she goes after him. And you, you can read it for yourself in Genesis 39. When she came after him, he fled so fast that, that basically his, his cloak was left in her hand. A little picture here for you to illustrate it. I mean, he, he was like, you know, I'm getting out of here. I don't care if I have to leave my cloak behind. I am fleeing the scene. Is there an area of your life where you need to drop your cloak and run? Is there an area in your life where you need to drop your cloak and run so that you don't hurt another person? Your spouse, your parent, your co-worker, so that you don't become an untrustworthy person. Where is the enemy tempting you? Where do you need to drop your cloak and flee as fast as you can? Number four, make it a daily habit to ask God to change your heart each day so that it is focused on serving Him and loving others well instead of being focused on your own personal happiness. You know, our culture says it's all about your personal happiness, right? Everything's about you. Just do you, right? But actually, that doesn't usually end very well. Usually we end up becoming um, people of low integrity. We break trust with people because I'm just going after what I want. I don't care about you. And so this little prayer every morning, I've been praying this one for actually probably about 20 years now, that God would change my heart every morning to make me more others focused than me focused and I have to pray that every day maybe you guys are better than me but I have to pray that every day <laughs> because otherwise the, the me and me will just jump to the forefront and say it's all about me today and how should you make me happy and so I have to pray that prayer every day Lord change my heart so that I'm serving you and focusing on loving others and then fifth intentionally dwell on the blessings that come from being obedient to God which includes being trustworthy God calls us to be trustworthy, and if you focus intentionally on the blessings that come from obeying God, that can be kind of a strong motivation, right? Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. That honestly is often how I stay on track. I mean, I don't always perfectly stay on track, but, but this is how I do stay on track most of the time is I remind myself, I don't want to miss out on the blessings God has for the righteous person, for the person who's doing their best to obey the Lord. And so sometimes quoting the scripture helps me to stay, like when I was dating Raul, it helped me to stay sexually pure. I don't want to miss the blessings that God has for the person who's obeying him, so I'm going to stay sexually pure while I'm dating. Or whatever the thing is, in terms of being trustworthy, I'm going to be trustworthy because I don't want to miss the blessings God has for the person who's trying to obey the Lord. And at sixth, remind yourself that if you want people to be loyal and faithful to you, you need to be the same toward them, right? You reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So 
that's a little bit about how to develop this deeper, deeper um, trust in the Lord and how you can become a trustworthy person. But some practical thoughts here on how to rebuild trust in a relationship when it has been broken by you. And I know this probably doesn't apply to anyone here today, but maybe at some point you kind of let someone down. And so, you know, for the one person in the room this applies to, I thought we'd go through this, right? Okay, so first of all, realize this is a process and depending on the severity of the betrayal, it may take months or years to regain the trust of that person. And literally, sometimes it takes years. Because if there's been like unfaithfulness in a marriage or some, even if like a friend, I have a friend who gossiped about me probably, oh goodness, this is probably like 12 years ago, and she did it twice in a way that was actually really harmful and to be honest, I still am a little hesitant to confide in this person. And it's 12 years later. So I'm just saying, when there's been a betrayal, especially several betrayals, it might take a while to restore trust in that relationship. It is a process. Secondly, be humble and take responsibility for betrayal instead of blame shifting. Isn't it so tempting to do the blame shifting, though? Well, if you wouldn't have done that, it wouldn't have caused me to... James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Third, you must be willing to be 100% accountable and transparent with that person. No secrets. No secrets. In marriage, this might mean no separate bank accounts, no private email accounts, no private Facebook accounts. Like, you are determined to keep no secrets. If they want to know where you were at 6.32 in the morning, you should be able to tell them. I mean, it's like enough, there's nothing that's off limits. You, know, you, have, you have to regain trust by being completely open with no secrets. Number four, sometimes this means being willing to break free from old friends or even change workplaces that have been unhealthy and played a part in the breach of trust. Ooh, that's kind of big stuff though, right? But sometimes that's what's necessary. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Let me tell you a little story about how this worked in a relative's life of mine. I have a relative who, um, his wife was pretty sure he was having an affair with some people at his workplace over, over many years. You know how wives just know these things? Wives just know these things. It's just a gift we have. <laughs> and so, um, I don't know that he ever truly confessed that it was the case, but I mean, pretty much. Anyway, um, and, and she was like, well, and he owned the business and had spent many years building up this business. And she said, you have to leave the business because in order to regain my trust, you can't work there anymore. You can't have these women working underneath you. You can't, you have to completely, no, you have to, you have to be willing to walk away from everything you built up. Your name is on the sign. It's your business, but you have to walk away. And he did. And their marriage was restored. I don't know that it would have been restored if he stayed there. And he had all sorts of reasons to. He built up this amazing business. And she said, I don't care if we're poor. I need to trust you. And so I'm saying sometimes it's a big deal that you have to walk away from a situation or unhealthy people or a place or a job if it played a part in that breach of trust. Number five, you must demonstrate with both your words and actions that you are for the person and they will need to see that sustained change over the course of many months or even years. I love Matthew 3, 8. It says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You have to produce that fruit that shows that you have really changed. And sometimes it does take years. And then sixth, regularly check in with this person to ask how you're doing and if there is anything else you can do to restore trust and be willing to make more changes. It all takes time. I know some of you are waiting for this next part because you're like, I've never broken anyone's trust, but boy, have people done wrong to me. Okay, so this is how to rebuild trust in a relationship when the other person has betrayed you in some way. First, realize that the Lord is grieving with you and longs for you to turn to him for comfort. He is grieving with you. Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. Think of how a little child runs to their mother when they're hurt, you know, they, they fell down, they skinned their knee, and they immediately run to their mom, and the child cries out and tells the whole horrible story of what has happened, and then confidently expects their mom to fix it. God wants us to run to him the same way, and pour out the story, 
and cry with him and then confidently expect him to fix it, to comfort us, to bring about justice, to soothe us, to bring about healing. Secondly, tell that other person, the person that hurt you, what you require to start the slow journey of beginning to trust them again and be specific. I've learned this in sitting with many couples where there's been a breach of trust. The, the victim, I'll just call them the victim in this case, has to be specific on what they're asking the other person to do to regain trust. Maybe you're requiring 100% transparency or that they attend a treatment program or, or go to counseling or an accountability group or whatever, but you've got to be specific. You need to talk about how long they need to do this thing because if you're not specific, they will go one time to a counselor and say, hey, okay, done, moving on. And you're like, uh, no. So be specific in what you believe you might require in order to start regaining trust. Be willing to forgive the person, realizing that we are all a work in progress. Now, forgiveness does not mean that trust has been restored. It just means that you won't try to make them suffer for what they did, which is our neurotic tendency, right? Like, I am going to make you suffer. I hope you hurt because you hurt me. So forgiveness means that I give up that motivation, that I'm not going to try to make you suffer for what you've done. Proverbs 12:19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Also, imitate Christ. Imitate Christ and be willing to welcome people back into relationship if they have truly repented. Jesus was betrayed by the people who were supposed to love him the most. We have betrayed Jesus, haven't we, over and over again? by picking our own personal comfort or happiness over serving him, and yet he continues to forgive us and welcome us back into relationship as soon as we repent. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And then our final point, unfortunately, is this. Realize that not every person is truly repentant and willing to do the hard work to restore trust, so you may choose to have boundaries with this person in order to guard your heart if they don't display sustained efforts to become trustworthy once again. Because not every person is truly repentant, is truly willing to do the hard work, because it is hard work to change behavior. Not every person is willing to do that, and so you may choose boundaries to protect your heart. Very familiar verse at Squadron of Sisters, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. There you have it.